Just so people can get some idea, we're not that far outside of Yosemite. We're not far at all. No, I tell people we're between Yosemite and Tahoe, and that's where we are. If you leave at 6,000 feet elevation, you hike into close to 10,000 feet before you start dropping back into up and down. The whole topography up here changes every year. You don't know what to expect. Uh, you don't know what logs are going to cross the trail that you have to work your way around to get here. There's really no good trails to get here. Uh, and if you don't know where it's at, you'll never find it. It's just one of those places. What year did the Sierra camp start? The camp's been here since the 50s. I didn't start coming up until 1971. And do you know what brought him to this spot? It's just one of those spots that uh, Warren used to say, this is as close to heaven as he thinks he'll ever get. Uh, it's so remote, the deer are plentiful. There's a lot of bear up here. Uh, it's pristine, there's a lot of granite. Uh, Fresh water coming right out of the ground. This is where the springs start and it goes down to the rivers, and it's just a gorgeous place to be. We was all a very sober camp, a very strict camp. You know, no unload before you came into camp. Uh, no alcohol was here. It was really a, a quite disciplined camp. Very, all the guys were professional people, so we uh, kept what was going on up here, whatever it was, we don't know, but kind of to ourselves for a long time. Yeah. And what was what was the average success rate for you guys coming up here? Oh, the deer, it was 100%. We never didn't get a deer. It was just, it's that kind of a place. That's about 40 feet, I think. How did we come out of here? What's your success rate? You said maybe 20%. We really didn't realize what we were dealing with. We still don't know what we're dealing with, but it was something very unusual. Strange things happen, and uh, most of the stuff happened in the evening time, just at dusk, nighttime, like now. The first time I ever heard anything was later in 71. I came back up with the guys, and, and uh, we was uh, here by the stove, there was a stove here then. <laughs> and uh, as soon as it starts getting dark, we'd go in. Sometimes you might hear a grunt or a whoop or a big blowing sound or something like that. And that's when you know you want to get inside the shelter because you still don't know what you're dealing with. Whatever it is, it's big, very, very big. We all go inside, close the shelter door, and uh, that's a log that we put between these trees. And then we'd strap it inside a cable. And then uh, then they would start making their sounds. And that was in 71 when I first started hearing them. And we started recording them.
talking about maybe having to shoot our way out. You're just sitting there, all of you are, are kind of petrified. You're just waiting to, for the walls to break open, and something reach in there and grab you and hold you up, and waiting for the light to break in the cracks of the walls, and it never happened. That's the strange part, because you hear it over there, but you don't see it over there. As time went on, 72, same thing. You know, whatever it was we thought might be trying to scare us out. Maybe this is their territory, but I, we don't know. We can only guess at why they were doing what they were doing and uh, that they were observing us, that's for sure. Well, we do know that their vocal range is much greater than human beings. Their uh, frequencies go way above and way below the abilities of human. I was trained in all of the deceptive practices in voice communications. Besides the fact that you have the creatures stepping on each other in their conversational turns, you have the, uh, the humans, like Ron, stepping on the creatures back and forth, overlapping their voices on the tapes. That can't be faked. Not in 1974. Plus, it's, it would be extremely dangerous uh, to come up here at night into a camp full of well-armed hunters. They don't go to bed at night without their guns at their sides. <laughs> It's ridiculous to think of it. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it just to coax a bunch of hunters up here. So from a 100% factual standpoint, we really don't know what's making this language sounds. That's right. We don't know. One time I heard a big, uh, sound like a huge tuning fork above us and you couldn't find a source of it. It's just a, a big sound like that. Sometimes you'd hear a sound out here and one time we thought our camp was being torn apart by something. We thought the barrels we'd packed in and was being torn up and tossed around and you look out here when all the commotion and the sound stop and nothing changed. Now how do you explain that? You know, one time we was in there, I thought I heard a car door slam out here. Now, come on, we're eight miles in the wilderness. <laughs> There's no... So aside from the sounds, you also saw some things in the sky, in the air? Yeah, uh, lights, yeah, orbs. Uh, other guys had reported orbs when I wasn't here. Uh, what a, uh, me and my friend Bill saw one night was a big blue ball coming down from up here slowly moving, definitely controlled, and had some type of intelligence about it. And I, you, if you were just looking up there, you would think it was the moon, but it was blue, it was moving down. We lost it behind the trees and went over there. So I don't know what to think of that. You don't know what to think about any of this stuff, you know. We were in a tent, it just almost, it wasn't this dark, but uh, this thing, what it was, just kind of starts moving across over here behind us. Uh, elongated light, about probably three foot long, probably about that big around, and uh, just a rod of light. I, I tell people when I talk about it, uh, it's, it's, it's like a Star Wars saber. <laughs> White, glowing, but not bright glowing, just glowing. And it just moved slowly through the trees, definitely controlled, and uh, dissipated over here. Is it embarrassing to talk about? No, I don't care. I'm old enough now, nothing bothers me. <laughs> what makes you keep coming back? Uh, the mystery that's still here. There's still a mystery that needs to be solved or understood. And uh, I'm here now because you're here. <laughs> I've been asked multiple times for, to be brought up here by different people and uh, I've turned them down basically because I don't want the area. It's such a pristine area still. I don't want it exposed to a bunch of researchers come up here, uh, just inundating the area. And I've also told uh, 
the hunters that still come up and their offsprings would still hunt the area, you know, that I'll uh, kind of keep it very private as much as possible. Uh, the shelter, although it's been dismantled now years ago, uh, it's still a place to come to. Nothing surprises me, nothing uh, up here. Why this is such a strange place, I have no idea, but uh, it is a very interesting area. We spent seven days with Ron and Scott at the Sierra Camp. And although we didn't experience anything paranormal, this area holds many secrets that we know for sure. <laughs>